You may have noticed, beloved, that the last part of our Lord's Supper form, which we read this morning, strongly emphasizes gratitude. After the communion, says the rubric, the minister shall say, and I quote, Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord hath now fed our souls at this table, let us therefore jointly praise his holy name with thanksgiving. It goes on to quote several verses from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. In which words and succeeding verses, we thank the Lord for forgiving our sins, for redeeming our life from destruction, for being merciful and gracious. The final prayer with which the form ends is entitled a thanksgiving. And the opening line of the prayer is, O Almighty, merciful God and Father, we render thee most humble and hearty thanks that thou hast of thy infinite mercy given us thy only begotten Son as a mediator. This is, of course, entirely appropriate because the Lord's Supper bespeaks the blessings of the new covenant which we have in Jesus Christ our Lord, and then we end with thanksgiving. God has given us these things and we're grateful to Him. Deuteronomy 26 strikes the same note, the exact same note. The note of gratitude, though the occasion, is different. The Lord's Supper deals with the New Covenant, Deuteronomy 22, 26, the Old Covenant. The Lord's Supper is recorded in three of the four Gospels and 1 Corinthians 11. Deuteronomy 26 occurs in the five books of the law. In the Lord's Supper, we focus on the cup. In Deuteronomy 26, it's a basket. We're going to look this evening at the basket of the first fruits. Very simply, what it is, and it's accompanying confession. This basket <coughs> the first fruits. To me, in studying this word of God, I was surprised that there was such a striking lack of unanimity amongst the orthodox commentators and theologians as regards the occasion or occasions when this basket of first fruits was to be brought. When was the basket of first fruits first to be brought? According to verse 1, it would appear that it was first to be brought after the conquest. It shall be, when thou art come in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possesses it, and dwellest therein, that thou shalt bring this basket of first fruits. That would mean that this was first obeyed in the days of Joshua, and the basket of first fruits would have been brought to the tabernacle, which was then in Shiloh. Another possible way of reading the passage is to say that this basket was first brought after the choice of Israel's great place of worship, because verse 2 ends, Thou shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. Then it would have been 
kept this word of God in the days of David and Solomon in the city of Jerusalem. But that reading isn't, isn't as popular. There's another issue. Was this word of God with the basket of first fruits to be kept only once or once every year. If it was kept only once, then that option might fit better if the basket of first fruits was to be brought up at the conquest or just after the conquest. And then the third question is this. What time of the year would this basket of first fruits have been brought up? Would they have brought up these fruits at the Passover when they had to go up to the tabernacle or temple anyway? Or at the Feast of Pentecost, which is what Martin Luther thought. Or, as others say, you could have brought these first fruits at any of the three pilgrimage feasts whenever you were up in Jerusalem anyway, depending on what types of fruits grew in your land and the lunar calendar and when you were up in Jerusalem. Or another possibility is that you didn't bring up the basket of first fruits at any of the three great feasts, but you made a separate trip up to the holy place just whenever the various fruits were all right. And if that was the case, that you had to do that or it was best to do that as soon as all your fruits were ripe that you were going to put in your basket, then that would have made four trips to the holy place. Then that might suggest that Deuteronomy 26 was only to be, to be obeyed once when Israel first came into the land as a special ordinance of God. You see the three questions, when was this to be obeyed, when was it, was the beginning of this, was it at the conquest under Joshua, or was it with the establishment of Jerusalem as Israel's religious center. Then there's the frequency, once only or annually, and then there's the question as to the season or time of the year, at the Passover, Pentecost, at any of the feasts, whichever one fits best, or simply whenever all of your fruits were ripe. As I pointed out in various ways, these three questions are somewhat interrelated. If you go with that option for one of those questions, then that would more easily fit with an answer to another question. But no doubt you'll be relieved that for our present purposes, our purposes, our present purposes, no doctrine and no calling of the New Testament Christian depends on one's answer to these questions. <clears throat> so we don't have to decide upon one and then we don't have to spend time in this sermon <coughs> defending our position with all sorts of references to verses in the Pentateuch. And I would guess that the Pentateuch wouldn't be that part of the Bible on which you are hot. Instead, what we're going to do, keep it simple, we're going to envisage the basket of first fruits being brought up to the tabernacle in Shiloh, which is where it was according to Joshua 18 verse 1, the tabernacle in Shiloh, in the first year after the conquest of Canaan, 
which conquest of Canaan took seven years, according to the age of Caleb in Joshua 14. Tabernacle and Shiloh, the first year after the conquest of Canaan, at some undetermined time after harvest. And this I say, keeping it simple, would at the very least seem to fit with the passage. Verse 1. It shall be when thou art come in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possessest it, and dwellest therein. Well, the land has been won through Joshua's sword, according to God's power, and divided up. That thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall put it in a basket, and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. God chose Shiloh for it name. And his name was there because the tabernacle was there, and the holy furniture, and the priesthood. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days. And the Azar, or Phineas, or some of the other priests. What else then can we say about this event or occasion? What about this basket? The basket, according to most authorities, would have been a wicker work basket, that is, with plaited twigs. And you can still buy and see such baskets for the same type of basket or sort of basket today. In this basket was to go the first of all the fruit of the earth, which raises the obvious question, well, what sort of fruits did they grow? What sort of fruits would have been in that basket? And the obvious verse here, and it's an easy one to remember, is Deuteronomy 8, verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8, which reads, God here is describing Canaan, Remember, it's the perspective of Deuteronomy. They're in the plain of Moab, just about to cross the river Jordan and enter western Canaan. This land will be, quote, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey. So, the fruit of the earth here includes grains, barley, and the more expensive grain, <coughs> wheat. Then there is what we would think of <coughs> as fruit in a more specialized sense, grapes from the vine, figs, pomegranates, and olives, those four, from trees or vines. And then there's honey which doesn't grow on a tree, but it may be hanging from a tree in the form of a beehive. So seven things. And if you say, well, does that list intend to be exhaustive? No, no. Most reckon that dates would have been grown and then some people would have put dates into their basket and other things too. So all of these things then were put into one basket designed to be carried. The baskets were hard to make of a really big size and if you made them a really big one you couldn't carry them on your arms. So think of a basket with some grain in there and obviously grain being fairly small it's going to be presumably in a bag. So a little bag of grain, wheat, a little bag of barley. Then you have the honey. Presumably it's going to be in some sort of pot. The other <coughs> Fruits could be set in in various ways. And the Jewish commentators, for whatever reason, say that these things were arranged in layers with this fruit set down in the bottom layer, and this one above it, and that one above it, with some sort of separating paper, whatever. I mean, they had paper in those days, but they had things like paper. But they're all in there. 
And to gather these fruits from trees, plus the honey, plus the grains, obviously some sort of thought and effort and <coughs> careful collecting would have been necessary to identify the different sorts of fruit that grow in your land and to get the first fruit of this and that and the other one because not all of such things would be ripe at the same time, especially the barley and the wheat aren't harvested at the same time. You can read the book of Ruth for instance. And then when the last item of fruit is harvested, or if you can talk about harvesting or making ready the first fruit of it, glean some of it, then your task is complete. Then you can head to Shiloh, because as I said, we're taking into refer to the first one, in the first year after the conquest of the land, you're going up to Shiloh, in near the center of the promised land. And if you're from the half tribe of Manasseh, or Gad, or Reuben, you're going to have to cross the River Jordan, and you'll be looking for one of the well-known fords. If you're from Naphtali, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar, or the other half-tribe of Manasseh, in the north, you're going to head south. If you're of the tribe of Judah, or Simeon, or Benjamin, or Dan, in the south, you're going to have to head north. And if you're of the tribe of Ephraim, in which Shiloh is found, you won't have to walk as far with your basket. One basket on one arm with all these different first fruits in it. So what's the idea then of bringing these first fruits to God? Well, it is a symbolic act that declares that these first fruits belong to Jehovah. They're not mine, says the offerer. They're not those of the people of God. Ultimately, they belong to the God of heaven and earth. And in that it is the first fruits that are brought to God, there's an element of self-denial in this offering. The Israelites, of course, didn't have greenhouses or freezers or fridges we do today, so many of their fruits are seasonal only. <coughs> so the believing Jew, he's waiting for the new harvest or vintage of whatever, and he sees that they're coming right. Well, he can't just say, oh, I love that particular fruit. They're the first ones, and then he has to hold on and he has to bring the first fruit to God and not eat it himself. And bringing these first fruits to Jehovah, he declares thereby that it's not just the fruits in the basket that God owns. That would be a serious mistake to me. But all the fruit belongs to God. The idea of the first fruit is that the first fruits are representative. They represent the whole, the full harvest which is going to come in in due time. So all belongs to Jehovah. All the crops and all the fruits are God's. And of course, for good measure, we may add that all the livestock belongs to the God of heaven on earth too. Even the cattle on a thousand hills. Which thousand isn't the And in that, all these first fruits are brought together in one basket. It declares that all the various fruits are from the Lord together. He sent the rain, the sunshine, he nourished them with the soil beneath, he 
gives each and every plant just what it needs. Palm for the bees to make honey, growth of the seeds for the barley and the wheat, protection for the vines and the olive trees and so on, so that the God of heaven and earth looks after and cares for each particular crop and all of them together. And all of this is included in the idea of this basket of first fruits. And you can imagine the man coming with this on his arm, a long walk for most of them, <coughs> and he's thinking to himself, now what does this mean? What sort of fruits have I got in there? Why am I giving this to God? Why am I going up there? It all comes from Jehovah's hand. And this is to be our attitude too. Not that any of us lives in the land of Israel, or that many of us are into farming. But this is our attitude with regard to our income. And even say our assets to use accounting terminology. We've been doing that in a different connection <coughs> on Wednesday night as we look at imputation in the truth of justification. Income, assets, all comes from God who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And when we say it comes from God, we confess thereby his marvellous providence through a thousand and one links in the chain. Whatever of the world's goods that you possess, you need a certain amount of health to acquire, a certain amount of ability. Some of it, no doubt, has come from your family or the support of family and friends. And all these factors, and I didn't mention all of them, ultimately lie in the hand of God. Everything we have came from the hand of God, just as really and truly as everything in that basket came from the Father of lights. And this is the idea, therefore, in our offerings. It's wider than this, but that is one application. When we give our offerings to the work of the kingdom, we do not merely think, well, this is all I can spare. We don't simply think, well, this is what I always give. We don't merely think, oh, is it that time already? Friday, Saturday, I may as well get my checkbook out and fill it in. And all such things are reasonable, understandable things for us to think, but in our giving to the work of the kingdom, our consciousness is, it has all come from my heavenly Father, That's the source and origin of everything that I have, and of me. What happened is that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ opened his hand. He gave this to me. And I give to support the kingdom of Jesus Christ in this consciousness of faith that none of my possessions ultimately are mine. That I'm a tenant in my house, even if I own it. That God owns everything and he has given them these things to me for a certain time in order to serve him. And that's the attitude I have through the week, says the Christian, when he's thinking in terms of faith. He may not be thinking that very often because he doesn't walk by faith the way he should. But this is his attitude through the week. And this is the attitude that God calls us to have, especially on one day of the week, when we come to church. And we think God brings his word to bear upon us and we think that he is the giver of every good, perfect gift. The giver of all things. And all of that, of course, isn't very 
easy. It's not easy because we're very prone to forget these things. And we think that these things are nearly too simple for us. We're adults. We've been to church for years. That minister at the front, he's not telling me anything I don't know. Well, fair enough. I don't have to. But he's telling us something that we always need to hear. That's the difference. And that's the point. And this passage of the Word of God tells us about a basket. Where's your basket? You hang it over your arm. And he says to us, God does, thereby, Think about that. Deuteronomy 26. Never really thought about that passage much before. Think about that. Because it conveys the right idea. You give your first fruits in all the areas of your life to the Lord because all of it comes from Him. Then you bring that basket with you every day, every Sunday to church. I'm not meaning this literally. I don't expect liberal wicker baskets in the narthex next Sunday. Nor am I even saying that the offerings should be more. You give very generously. That's not the point. The point is we're to give it with the right attitude. Give it in faith. Then we honour the Lord even if <coughs> We can only give the widow's might, and even if we actually end up giving less, it's the attitude that's the key thing. And then notice when this basket, sorry, where this basket is to be brought and to whom. Verse 2 says, Put these first fruits in a basket and go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to put his name there. The tabernacle, the place where God dwelt, where he revealed himself. And if you say, where especially at the tabernacle, verse 4 answers that the priest will take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. That's not referring to the golden altar in the tabernacle just before the Holy of Holies. That's referring to the brazen altar or the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the court of the tabernacle. The idea is not that we're going to put this honey or these dates or these pomegranates or the grain on the altar so as to burn them, but the idea is rather that the altar part because of what happens at the altar. The altar is a place of special consecration and dedication to God. So you set them on the altar, not because they're going to be burnt there, but because that speaks of setting apart to Jehovah. And so the second half of verse 10 says, regarding this basket of first fruits, thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God. Verse 4 says, set it down before the altar of the Lord our God. Verse 10 says, explaining verse 4, thou shalt set it down before the Lord thy God. It's a place where God is especially present, as dedicated and set apart for his purposes. We bring it to the altar, the altar of the tabernacle, and there we bring it to the priest. The priest is mentioned in verse 3. And verse 4. And the nearest New Testament special office there, the one nearest to a priest, is the deacon who administers the church's mercies to the needy. And what is the confession that accompanies this basket of first fruits? Verse 3 says, Thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord sware unto our fathers for to give us. These first 11 verses of Deuteronomy 26 repeat time and time again that the land of Canaan is a gift from Jehovah. Verse 1, 
the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 2. Take first of all the fruit of the earth which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 9. He hath brought us into this place and hath given us this land. Turn to verse 3. I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. The country was one grand gift. Here it is. I have given you a country. This gift is described in verse 1 as an inheritance, accentuating the fact that it is of grace unmerited, <coughs> undeserved, and free. It's an inheritance. The Father, in his care, has bequeathed this to you. And it's also described, this land, as a gift and an inheritance in fulfillment of God's oath. And God keeps the third commandment, so to speak. I am come unto the country, verse 3, which the Lord swear unto our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, for to give us in his covenant faithfulness, keeping his oath over many generations and many years, even centuries. So here's the land. It's a gift. It's an inheritance. It's all according to God's oath. And it's also because God gives a gift of great quality, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Look what you've inherited. Look what I've given you. Just as Moses said, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the point of this basket at this time is that this good land Gifted to us by God is our land. We're in it. We possess it. We dwell in it. That's verse 1. The land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and thou possessest it, and dwellest therein. And now the God who has given this fine land has also given fruit of the land. He gives you the land. And he gives you the fruit that the land produces, according to verses 10 and 11. So if the whole thing from beginning to end, from top to bottom, is all of Jehovah's mercies. And now this basket of the first fruits is proof. We possess the land. <coughs> Here's the fruit of it. It's a confession also of debt. Debt to the Lord for his goodness giving us this land. I profess this day when the basket is set down and given to the priest. I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. My father didn't make that confession. He died. I don't even know his grave. He died in the wilderness. Because he didn't believe. And now I am here with a basket of my arm. God was true. My father didn't believe. He didn't enter in. God was true. <clears throat> then the lengthy speech of verses 5 through 10. Because verse 3 is just a short profession. The lengthy speech of verses 5 through 10 begins with a confession of the humble origins of God's people. Verse 5, Thou shalt speak and say, the Lord puts these words in the mouths of his people. Thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, A Syrian ready to perish was my father. A Syrian? You say, but surely he wasn't a Syrian. Surely he was a Jew, he was an Israelite. But don't boast in that. He was a Syrian. He was a Syrian. His mother, Rebecca, because we're talking here about Jacob or Israel. His mother, Rebecca, was a servant. So there you are. He's half Syrian. 
He spent 20 years of his life in Syria. Christ was called a Nazarene, though he was born in Bethlehem. Both of his wives and both of his concubines, Jacob's, came from Syria. Eleven of his twelve sons were born there to these Syrian wives and Syrian concubines. <coughs> Only Benjamin was born. A Syrian was my father. There is one to humble the Jewish pride and to humble the Christian pride. A Syrian ready to perish was my father. That's my origin. A Syrian ready to perish. Esau comforted himself with the notion that he was going to kill Jacob or Israel. So he had to leave and flee. And when he returned to the promised land, he was very fearful lest his older brother, older by some minutes, was going finally to get it. A Syrian ready to perish. Jacob may have thought that to himself too when he was out there in the cold nights looking after Laban's sheep for 20 years. When he fled from Laban in fear, and God had to scare the bits out of Laban in a dream by night to rein him in. But even perhaps when Father Jacob was short of food in the land of Canaan, in the days of the famine prophesied by Jacob. A Syrian ready to perish was my father. That would have been a great confession for the Pharisees. Christ's public ministry. And only a few of us, only a few, just 70, 70 went down into Egypt. And what were they? Strangers and sojourners in Egypt, soon to become slaves in Egypt. The Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us our bondage, verse 6 says. They killed the midwives were told, rather, to kill the male children, but they refused. The Egyptians were told to take the male children and throw them into the river Nile, though Pharaoh's own daughter refused to do that. They were forced to build the Egyptian cities. They were beaten by cruel taskmasters, and they were told. <coughs> Make your bricks without straw and keep making as many <coughs> as you did when you had straw. Humble origins. The humble origin, spiritually speaking, of all Christians today. The humble origins of the church. Our humble origins. Because the Christian has nothing of himself. And this is how the Apostle Paul taught us all to think. Remember, he says in Ephesians 2, that in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And don't forget it. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's the New Testament equivalent of a Syrian ready to perish was my father. Fast on the heels of the humbling confession of our origin is the confession of salvation, all of grace alone. What happened? Jehovah multiplied us when we were 70 and within a few generations he brought us up to 2-3 to three million. That would be some going for our church, wouldn't it? A few generations. 2 or 3 million. Jehovah pitied <coughs> us and he heard our prayers when we were in distress in Egypt. He sent the 10 plagues and he opened up the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh on his coast. The Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. 
and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Or as chapter 4 verse 34 puts it, Hath God assayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation? By temptations, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. <coughs> then God conquered the Canaanites and granted them the inheritance of the good land. He brought us, says the man with the basket, into this place. And hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. And he didn't do it, says Psalm 44, by our bow or sword. And now behold, the confession ends in verse 10, and now behold, after all this, our humble origins, and all of this grace from Jehovah, and now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which thou, O Lord, Hast given. It was all a gift. An eloquent confession. A heartfelt confession that sums the whole thing up. I have simply brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given. So the basket of first fruits comes along with this accompanying confession. Here's the basket, and here are the words. <coughs> Confession of gratitude for deliverance and redemption, for the fulfillment of God's oath and promises. A confession that Jehovah, despite all the lies of the enemy and all the apostates in Israel, a confession that Jehovah kept his covenant. You brought us into the land, Lord, and here are the first fruits. And you even told me to do this before we came into the land of Deuteronomy, when we were in the plains of Moab. This is therefore an act of religious worship, not just carrying a basket, an act of worship <coughs> with humility, with thankfulness, and with praise. And this teaches us the calling of each and every Christian, for we enjoy a greater redemption. Not merely from Egypt, but from sin. And ours is a great Savior. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who died for our sins. And this is our calling, especially after partaking of Christ's broken body and shed blood this morning. Because we who drink of his cup must surely bring our basket in gratitude. And then this passage on the basket of first fruits ends with two things. Worship. Thou shalt set the basket before the Lord thy God, verse 10 says, and worship before the Lord thy God for all his mercies. Worship, and verse 11 adds, communal joy before the God of the covenant. Enjoy all these good things that God has given you. Enjoy them. Enjoy them with thanksgiving unto him. And share them. Share them with your family, with the Levite, and with the stranger. Share and give to help the needy as you rejoice before the Lord for his goodness. And come to church next Sunday and thereafter with your basket.